it's fun to do these because we, we never quite know who's out there, but I know that it's a lot of, you know, terrific people that really care about making a difference and strengthening the community and looking forward to seeing many of you at the JFN conference next month. I'm really excited to um, introduce you to our great panel and to um, let them, kind of the experts, take the take over. So I'm going to keep my introductory comments to a minimum. Um, as mm -hmm. Tamar mentioned, I'm the executive vice president of the Leash Tag Foundation. And about 10 years ago, we embarked on a process after becoming independent where we had a resource that was designated to in part, strengthen and promote vibrant Jewish life in our region. Our region, to give you some context, um, about 100,000 Jews or so in North San Diego. Um, and I always joke that um, when the Pew study results of the Jewish community came out a couple years ago and there was lots of discussion about it and everybody was wringing their hands and saying, it's such a crisis, like we actually thought that the Pew study results look good because in our community, about 7%, um, only 7%, or 7% of um, uh, uh, people are um, affiliated with any kind of traditional synagogue or Jewish institution. And about 80% um, are traveling through life with people who aren't Jewish. So when we, so married to people who aren't Jewish, maybe raising children with people who aren't Jewish. Um, so when we kind of set about to what does it really look like to promote Jewish life in this region, we knew that we had to go beyond um, some traditional maybe thoughts that we had, prescriptions that we had, and really listen to the community. And we facilitated a number of focus groups. We spoke to experts. We spoke to on the ground um, uh, grassroots leaders here. And what we heard was really interesting. We asked, what are you interested in? And they talked about caring for the environment, caring about what they eat, caring about their health and the health of their neighbors. They talked about wanting to, they, they talked about Jewish experiences that they had had, um, some positive and many where they didn't quite feel completely welcomed, completely at home. They sometimes felt self-conscious about their levels of observance. So we had some really rich discussions and we came out of it really um, heartened because we felt that, okay, they didn't say going to synagogue or um, uh, kind of the traditional, like that's how we wanna spend all of our time, but they did talk about principles and values and practices that are so inherently Jewish. They didn't say we want to spend our time going shopping or going to Legoland, and, but they didn't know that they were Jewish. They were actually praying with their feet in the words of Heschel, but they didn't know it. And so what an opportunity we saw to help them create meaning and to meet them where they are and actually show that, yeah, you are good Jews because you are, you're, you are caring about things that are very important in Jewish practice. And so with that, we started to learn about the uh, field of Jewish community farming, of which the people that we're you're going to hear from in a bit are really the leaders, the pioneers and the, 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 the tillers, there are so many good metaphors you can use in a, in a farming context. Um, we met our friends Yakir, Nati, Yoni, among many other um, people around the country who were making a difference by operating Jewish farms and really bringing um, education and living to ancient Jewish practices. Um, we found that Jewish community farming, that we'll hear a little bit more about definitions and uh, in a bit, but Jewish community farming is actually a really um, effective funding strategy for a lot of different funding interests. Whether you care about Jewish education, whether you care about Jewish engagement, whether you worry about the food system, whether you have concerns about the health, health issues, whether you're interested in youth at risk or maybe um, engaging seniors as they get older. Many and many of those um, fields and many of those goals can be found on the farm. Many of those potential solutions can be found at the at the Jewish community farm. Certainly to facilitate the environmental stewardship, climate change, again, the farm is a classroom that is engaging for multiple generations. Um, and 
just to fast forward very quickly to where we are today, as partly as a result of that, we, we actually purchased, the, the Leash Tag Foundation purchased an agricultural property here in San Diego. And we've, we launched um, a Jewish community farm, Coastal Roots Farm, that has never had to pay for advertising. Um, because it's all word of mouth. On, on Sunday, we had hundreds of people at the Tubi Shabbat Festival. We celebrate Sukkot on the farm, Pesach, Shavuot, all the different Jewish holidays. We observe at Jewish agricultural laws. We, people are finding new relevance and meaning. It's not, it's not for everybody, but many, many members of our Jewish community are finding meaning, connection, engagement, at the Jewish Community Farm. So with that, there's no better people to tell you more than the people that we've gathered here today. And as Tamara mentioned, um, we're gonna do, we're gonna take some questions at the end. So please be submitting questions, thinking about questions. I'm first gonna call on um, um, Nati, Nati Passau. Nati is the founder of the Jewish Farm School, um, which was one of, and was one of the first leaders that we spoke to. Nati's based in Philadelphia. One of the things that we thought was most creative besides, besides all the creative things that Nati is interested in is how he's really gone also and found that there's a lot of farmers who are Jews. There, there's a lot of Jews involved in urban farming endeavors that maybe aren't connected in other ways to the Jewish community. And so a lot of opportunities for push-pull. Um, before I turn it over to Nati to share, we, we were so, um, uh, struck by the opportunity of Jewish community farming that several years ago we along with partners and practitioners funding partners launched the Jewish community field building initiative which which convenes those leaders in the field to strengthen best practices to get together peer networks and to really make the case and build the case for why Jewish community farming is an important piece of a Jewish of Jew, the, the, the Jewish puzzle in, in ancient days, now and moving forward. And Nati was a key leader in that effort. He developed um, or led the development of a theory of change. He um, has been involved in the release of a research report. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Nati to tell us a little bit more about, about his experience and the Jewish community farming field. Nati? Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here from rainy Philadelphia. Um, about to later today, heading down to the Pearlstone Center where Yakir is for the first ever Jewish Farmers Conference, which should be really exciting. Um, 160 people um, connected to Judaism and farming gathering together for a weekend. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and excited for this opportunity to share a little bit about Jewish community farming and some of the work that has come out of the field building initiative that Charlene just mentioned. So um, kind of as a starting point to, to understand what we mean when we're talking about Jewish community farming, um, when the field building initiative uh, first started, there were about 15 different significant Jewish farm based projects happening around North America and Israel. Um, and um, everyone was kind of taking slightly different approaches. So one of the first things that we had to do was kind of come up with some common language and a common definition of, of what we mean. Um, but before we even look at that, I'll pull that up on the screen in just a moment. Um, I just wanna share what I think is kind of like the impetus behind this movement. Um, it grew very organically for the first 10 to 15 years before there was this formal field building work that was happening. And I think that the reason why these projects started to um, take root and, and thrive in a number of different places is because they speak to a number of different um, realities that were present. I mean, Charlene, I think what you just said about the Pew study and, um, is, really, is, is really apropos. Um, I think that these, these programs draw people who are really looking for meaningful Jewish experiences and weren't necessarily finding them in other places. Um, they might be interested in or concerned about the environmental challenges that we're facing. They might be really connected to food, whether that's cooking or growing food or wanting to learn more about that, connecting to land um, and being in community with, with other like-minded Jews who are doing this um, and really finding ways to kind of bring the tradition um, to life. You know, one sixth of the Jewish 
uh, of Jewish law is Jew Jewish agricultural laws. And that is something that for most of us growing up in the United States in, in the 20th and 21st century, that's not something that we necessarily um, encountered so much. So one of the things that we feel very strongly about is that Jewish community farming is not like some new fad or um, something um, trendy. It's actually deeply authentic and rooted in our, in our history. Um, and so um, one of the main goals of the initiative was to um, come up with common language that we could use and develop a set of common tools that we could use to advance both our individual projects and our field. And so what I wanna pull up, I'm gonna share the, uh, here we go. Um, over the course of a few years, we um, worked with Informing Change, an outside consulting group to develop a bunch of tools. Um, and the end result, which is, is just being published now, is this report, which you um, were happy to share um, full access, access to the full report. Um, but I wanted to point to a couple of specific things. So as I scroll down, you'll see um, the Jewish community farming fieldwide theory of change. So um, we felt like it was important to come up again with kind of common language that we could all use um, and a common definition of what we're talking about and a, a, a shared theory of change. How, how are we collectively working to, to move the needle in the Jewish community on a variety of issues? So at the top, you see kind of like our, our general definition, the Jewish community farming field integrates Jewish experiential education with agriculture in order to cultivate community, promote environmental sustainability and food justice, foster opportunities for meaningful spiritual engagement and personal growth, and strengthen Jewish life. So there are many different kind of touch points and angles um, that, um, that our work uh, kind of centers around, um, which is why I think what Charlene mentioned is so true that um, we, the, the work can kind of, I think the most common response that JCF organizations have gotten over the years from funders is kind of confusion more than anything else. And um, one of the things that I think um, we want to really highlight is how we can speak to so many different priorities that different community stakeholders, whether they're participants or funders, might have. So that's kind of the overarching um, definition that we are working with at, for the field as a whole. Um, we then kind of came up with these core values that are um, fairly straightforward, kind of drawing on um, some of really ancient Jewish agricultural practices and, and other values and applying them to the context of our work. Um, and if you look down in the middle of the page on strategies, there's a couple of things that I wanted to point out. Um, one is you can see that there are many different types of strategies that we're employing. Um, the integration of, of Jewish environmental and place-based education, um, really highlighting Jewish uh, holidays and rituals and traditions, um, bringing them to life. I once was at the farm at Pearlstone many years ago with my brother, who's a rabbi. He was in rabbinical school at the time and we were walking the fields, learning about the agricultural laws that they were modeling in the field. And this is someone, my brother, someone who was in the middle of rabbinical school studying these texts on a regular basis. And he said, he was blown away. He said, this is in three dimensions, whereas I engage with it in two dimensions. And it was just such a powerful moment for him to see how these, these concepts, especially for people who don't have the familiarity, can come to life when we see them um, in, real, in, in real life. Um, so many of our programs focus on kind of deep immersive experiences for Jewish educators and leaders in the field. Um, so strong personal growth, leadership development, um, those become um, core components of our work. Um, the farming is not an aside. It's not just a means to the end of Jewish education or Jewish engagement, but there's also, we see tremendous importance and value in the actual skills that we're teaching, whether it's growing food or learning how to live more sustainably. Um, we're not necessarily trying to produce um, a massive new generation of Jewish farmers per se, but people who have the environmental literacy to live more sustainably, um, we recognize the importance of that in, in today's day and age with climate changing um, and environmental challenges being something that we're, we're hearing about all the time. 
Um, and then the last thing that I'll say about kind of the model as a whole is that it inevitably is a hyper-local kind of model. It's place-based education in the deepest sense of the word. Um, we are, our projects are really rooted on, um, on land um, and are engaging the community immediately around that land. And as Charlene spoke to the success of Coastal Roots Farm, they built this farm and like she said, they don't have to advertise and hundreds and sometimes thousands of people are coming to events because they're craving the type of experience that JCF uh, projects are able to um, provide. Um, I want to skip ahead a little bit and just look at um, some of the implications that the report uh, identified. Um, the process was we created the theory of change at first, we then created a set of shared evaluation questions that we could use, that we could put out to our collective participants and aggregate our data and see kind of as a, as a movement, as a field, how are we um, impacting people? Um, and that was the, that's the, the meat of the report or the results of the survey. And then at the end, we have these implications. And I wanted to just highlight a few, a few, a few of those um, implications. The first one being that we really, really need to recognize the success and the opportunity that our programs, um, uh, that, that our programs have, um, that these are, um, the impact can be on so many different kind of angles. Um, we're creating really meaningful and relevant Jewish experiences for our participants and for our staff. I mean, we've had a lot of staff who just by working at these projects have been transformed. Um, raising up food justice. Food justice, I think, in, in, in the sense of kind of ensuring that the needs of all members of our community are being met, um, our, the food needs are, are being met. Um, many of our projects kind of have taught about that, um, but have struggled at times to uh, actually engage in more direct food justice work. Um, and I want to share a quick anecdote. Uh, again, I'm based in Philadelphia and working with our local federation many, many years ago, before they, they funded us, I went in for a meeting and they had two departments. They had basically the Jewish education department and the social services department. And I said, well, we're trying to do something that kind of brings the two together. We want to work on food justice issues, food access, hunger, poverty issues here in Philadelphia, but we're going to do it in a way that's also educational, that also engages participants. And it was like they couldn't compute those two arenas were seen as two distinct things. And one of the things that JCF organizations have the, are already doing, but have the potential to do even better, um, is really integrate um, some of the, the social service impact that many Jewish funders are looking to have with Jewish educational experiences. Um, so I wanna highlight that. And then the last thing is if, um, that I wanna just name here, and I really invite you to look over the report, it's not too long, um, and there's some really interesting um, there are some really interesting implications that come out of it. But on this last page, um, there's a whole bunch of specific implications or recommendations. Um, continuing to measure shared outcomes, expand the, the shared survey, collect census information, uh, maintain shared language, etc. These are all things that were only possible because of the field building initiative that Charlene spoke about. Um, many of us know each other well within the field. But even so, we weren't collaborating in any sort of strategic or systematic way. And the field building initiative through annual um, conferences and different committees and different components of the initiative really allowed us to um, work together in, in really effective ways. And we produced a lot of um, really wonderful um, outcomes from the, the three years of the field building initiative. And as we're looking to what might be a, a phase two or hopefully would be a phase two of the initiative, I mean, these suggestions from informing change really require um, that to continue uh, in order to be effective, that there needs to be some sort of more formal process that holds us all together. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up my piece now. I'll come back a little bit later to talk about one other aspect of the field building initiative, um, but I will uh, hand it back to Charlene. Um, thanks, Nati. That was a really great overview. And that um, the theory of change and the report um, we're really excited about, particularly as a funder of programs in this in this area. Um, beginning, you know, there were we co-funded some initial research efforts around the Jewish outdoor 
food farming and environmental education movement that I think Yakir is going to refer to a little bit. This is the first deep dive research and evaluation into Jewish community farming and has given us such rich data to be able to both strengthen our own case internally to invest in these programs, but also to make the case to others. And I remember that in the first kickoff to the, um, to the Jewish Community Farming Field Building Initiative, we had a person some of you may know um, be the kickoff speaker, Chip Edelsberg, who was the executive director of the Jim Joseph Foundation, then a good friend. And he came down and he said, you know, you guys are great, but you need to go beyond the anecdotes you need to i think he even called the group granola <laughs> um, but he said like you you're doing incredible work you're on the front lines of jewish engagement and education you need both the both the the warm and fuzzy stuff and the data to back this up and we feel very proud that at least we've gotten a really good start through the jewish community farming field building initiative to getting to that really good advice that chip provided to us and we were really grateful actually when the jim joseph foundation was one of the funders that that um, co-funded with us the the phase one of the initiative so we're gonna now go to two quick case studies um, we mentioned earlier that jewish community farming is a tool for multiple desires um, for multiple funding interests and so yakir manella who is just a sage of the field um, is the executive director of the pearlstone conference center and program in Baltimore, a really important personal mentor to us. And um, he's gonna talk uh, more about Jewish education and how, you know, if your funding interest is Jewish education, the farm is a really important tool, followed by Yoni Yafet, who um, operates Kaima Farm in Israel, um, who I'm gonna interview and, and uh, Kaima focuses on youth at risk, but he'll talk about that more later. Now we're gonna turn it to Yakir. Thank you, Charlene. It's, it's great to be with everybody. Again, I'm the CEO of the Pearlstone Center here in Baltimore. Uh, it's really, really an honor to be here. I want to thank Charlene and my fellow panelists and JFN and excited to, to jump in with a bit more information about, uh, about what Jewish farm based education looks like. Um, you can see on the slide here so many different ages, uh, so many different backgrounds um, on the farm and the farm is such a great educational tool. Uh, the paradigm that we really think about most when we talk about our education is living Judaism. We're a 180-acre campus uh, here, a retreat center, uh, outdoor education center, and we call it the Pearlstone Campus for Living Judaism. Because when we think about Jewish learning and Jewish life in the 21st century, it's, it can't be that it's just reading the words on a page or hearing uh, someone speak to you about it. It's got to be multi-sensory. It's got to be... Um, you know, the smells, the tastes, the muscle memory that we really feel and know. We know this from uh, Birthright, we know this from summer camp, and the Jewish farm uh, movement is really uh, similar in that way. And the, and, and the other way we think about living Judaism is that for Judaism to be a thriving culture and community in the 21st century, it has to respond to the urgent issues all around us. Issues like health and nutrition, issues like food justice and food deserts, Issues like the climate crisis and the farm and food are really powerful platforms to engage that work. Um, so to jump into what this actually looks like, the, the lesson that we teach more than any, any other uh, at Pearlstone is tzedek, tzedek, tir dof, justice, justice, you shall pursue. We really give folks a sense of what is the Torah's teaching on food justice and not who's kind of talking about how we really try to embody and practice uh, Torah teachings on the farm here. So we start that with maser tithing, whether it's tomatoes like in this picture or kale or collard greens, we'll have a group harvest 10, 10 pieces of the crop and they'll have two bins. So you put nine in the bin for us to keep and one in the tzedakah bin for tithing. And when the group has done that, we step back and say, so this is actually what tithing looks like. How does that feel? And having done this hundreds of times over the course of, the, of years, every single group says, it doesn't feel great. I want to give more to tzedakah. 
And the minimum is 10%, but you can give more. So we allow folks to adjust the bins. But we also point out that you're not supposed to give so much that you yourself become dependent on, on Sadaka. The Rambam is the one that, that brings that teaching down. So already with Maase, we're trying to make it real, make it alive, and also introduce some of the questions, some of the considerations of how to navigate. The next uh, teaching there is leket, gleanings. So for that, we'll have someone take a big armful of kale and his or her friends will line up kind of in an obstacle course and you have to sort of navigate your way through the obstacle course and inevitably a few leaves fall. So the group picks up those leaves and holds them up and what's that called? That's, that's leket, that's gleaning. Um, and that is another form of tzedakah. So those fallen leaves go into the tzedakah bin. And then there's peya, the corners. So we'll take a group into the field. We'll read directly from the Torah. Uh, the Torah says, don't harvest from the corners of your field, leave it for the poor, the orphan, the stranger, and the widow uh, to harvest. And we say, okay, so what does that look like to you? And groups will take that in a million different directions, how big the corner should be, where it should be, why did they decide that way? And it actually is really helpful to bring up the Mishnah, the commentary, where it says, actually, it has to be at least 1 60th of the field to follow Pea. And if it's going to be more than that, the three questions we should ask is, how big is the field? How are the crops doing? And what is the number of poor in your community? So by introducing the Mishnah, we really see how the Torah is pushing us to engage with real questions around food justice on the farm. Um, this last piece, Shechecha, is around forgotten crops. In that case, we'll take a group out and harvest, then we kind of fool them into leaving the farm and then point out, hey, what did we forget? Right, we forgot the crops. And guess what? As soon as you forget them, they don't belong to you anymore. They're also tzedakah. Um, because if you really needed them, you probably wouldn't have forgotten them. So in just 30 minutes to an hour, we can really give people a powerful, hands-on, visceral, visceral experience of what Torah food justice looks like. And as opposed to sometimes we think about philanthropy writing one check at the end of the year, Sadaka on the farm is really, we understand it to be a, an ongoing consciousness, a multifaceted practice every day throughout the year. And it really lifts up what did tzedakah look like in the Jewish tradition. The next thing I wanna uh, share, highlight, is our teaching with animals. Tsar Belei Chaim, the, the teaching of the, the mandate to show compassion towards animals. And you can see the pictures on the slide, such joy, such connection, when we're able to connect with these living things, whether it's chickens, goats, baby goats are totally 100% irresistible. Um, and, and we also have sheep on our farm. But it's not just about the joy. There's really a deeper teaching here. Um, and we often talk about how so many of our biblical heroes are shepherds. And is that really a coincidence? Uh, there's a story about Moshe that really illustrates the point. The story is that before, he, before the story of the burning bush, he was a shepherd in the desert. And one day, his animal, one of his animals wanders off. And rather than just say, oh, well, I'm going to let that animal go. It'll probably perish. But I have a whole flock to take care of. Moshe doesn't give up. He follows the Animal takes a long time to find it. And when he finds it, he feels bad. The animal is tired and he picks up the animal and puts it on his shoulders and carries it all the way back to the flock. And the Midrash teaches us that it's in that moment that Moshe, or that God looks down and says, that guy, this one, because you were a good shepherd for your flock, you'll be a good shepherd for my flock. So when we think about the animal pasture, it's a way to teach compassion it's a way to teach compassion towards animals. It's a way to cultivate compassionate leadership in our community, in our country, in our world, which we could probably all agree we could use more of. Um, so, so the pastor is really uh, a space for that kind of teaching as well. Um, the last example I wanna lift up is around the Hebrew calendar. Um, on the left here is the, the Hebrew calendar we created at Pearlstone. This has been replicated in a few other Jewish community farm spaces as well. And it's really a profound uh, vehicle to really lift up, increase our literacy around what is the Hebrew calendar, what are the months, how do they relate to the seasons, and really to understand how much our calendar is grounded in natural cycles and is grounded in agricultural cycles, and to be able to go through on Rosh Chodesh and plant in the month that we're celebrating, to understand the spiritual energy of that month, the emotional connotation, the agricultural connotation, and really go through the Hebrew calendar using a physical uh, garden space has become a very powerful tool here and elsewhere. So those are just a few examples, and I think they really uh, kind of add up to understanding how we could be so successful in this field. It's so embodied, it's so powerful. And, and from the Jaffe Report, Jewish Outdoor Food Farming and Environmental Education, the report that was done a few years ago, of which community farms are 
the largest and most significant part of that movement, we see that the vast majority of participants really have powerful experiences and walk away feeling motivated to make the world a better place through their Jewish values, uh, that Jewish tradition adds meaning to our lives, that we feel connected to Jewish religion and customs, and, and that there really are social benefits as well, Jewish friendship, Jewish community as well. So there's, there's really been success with, with participants, and this is a third party national study. We expect that impact to continue over time. Um, and that success has led to other kinds of success. I believe it's actually every single Jewish community farm organization has been featured in Slingshot as some of the most innovative Jewish organizations in North America. And here, and there are other, you know, very um, prominent uh, uh, awards we've received as well. Pearlstone and Urban Anama were the winner and runner up in the Lippmann Camper Prize for Applied Jewish Wisdom, a, a national uh, award amongst hundreds of, of applicants from across the, the spectrum of Jewish learning and Jewish community farm, these two Jewish community farms really highlighted as leaders um, in applying Jewish wisdom in creative ways. Project Accelerate is a multi-year capacity building program that's really targeting the next generation of Jewish leadership and Jewish organizations that represent uh, 21st century cutting edge Jewish life. And as, as we've talked about, the Jim Joseph Foundation has, has invested in the Jewish community farming field building initiative and in specific uh, organizations as well. There's a lot more work to do. There's a lot more support needed, but I think we see that the success is leading to some momentum on the national stage as well. And there are challenges. Um, from my perspective, probably the most significant of which is this critique we hear that this is nice, but it's not real Jewish education, it's Jewish life. And I hope when you hear me talk about Maaser, Leket, Pea, Shechicha, the Mishnah, Sarle Balei Chaim, the Hebrew calendar, um, hopefully we see that there is, there is real Jewish content here. There is a depth of learning and literacy. And in fact, the fact that it's embodied learning and experiential can help that learning be stickier, right? Can be retained in a different way than if we're just sort of reading it or learning it. Sometimes we hear this critique from people who haven't actually seen it or experienced it up close, but it is a perception critique that we are grappling with. We wanna, wanna be upfront about that. And from that place, you know, we're really, um, been looking to strengthen our field through a Jewish community farming educators community practice. We've built a Facebook uh, group to really engage educators across the country. And over the course of the last year, really have offered a lot of different webinars uh, to, to support those educators by lifting up some of the, the best leaders in our field, whether it's beekeeping uh, through Shoresh in Toronto, working with Orthodox uh, communities and on farms and gardens, thinking about how to do some of this programming in a calendar and holiday theme. Uh, context, uh, Maro and Pesach, um, and then more recently with, with Nati, uh, really grounding ourselves in the Jewish sources that speak to Jewish farming and the, a seed packet that really helps people get off the ground with these projects and, and helps all of us really strengthen the impact of our work. Uh, these, these webinars have been very highly attended, very popular, and very meaningful to the field as we try to, try to grow and strengthen our success. And I think all of that just adds up to a, a really interesting moment that we're in as a field. Uh, if we looked at this map 10 years ago and looked at where the Jewish community farms are, there'd be a lot fewer leaves. And the field has definitely grown, matured, and succeeded in a, a lot of ways. But we can also all probably see how there are a lot of Jewish communities all around the country that don't have access to this really compelling and innovative, successful work. And frankly, all of the organizations that do exist, we're all tr really trying to strengthen our impact, to grow our partnerships with the Jewish community, and to really be here for the long haul and, and help make Jewish life a thriving uh, thing in the Jewish community in the 21st century. So really excited about this opportunity, grateful uh, to be able to speak with everybody and excited to see where we go next. Thank you and passing it back to Charlene. Thank you, Yakir. Um, and you mentioned the seed pocket, Nati's gonna speak about the seed pocket after after Yoni and I have a conversation. Uh, but we're gonna switch gears a little bit, stay on the farm, but talk about the farm as a platform for, for I won't say something else entirely, but something that isn't focused as much on the Jewish education part. Yoni Yepet um, is joining us from just outside Jerusalem, Beit Zaid in, in Israel. Yoni, um, 
you're not, I, so you, you, I'm going to ask Yoni a couple questions. We thought you might be a little bit tired of slides by now, as wonderful as those slides were. So we're just going to have a little chat, Yoni and I. Yoni, um, you, your background isn't in farming and it's not in Judaism. Tell us a little more about your background, um, your professional background, and how you came to think about the farm as a tool in your professional work. So um, my background is, uh, is, is more about education. Um, always been in education, actually. Um, but always uh, was attractive also to be outside in the nature. And I remember myself uh, as a young guy, uh, that can't really find himself in the school, going outside uh, to to the hills here in the Jerusalem area, and that was my relief. That was where I felt better, and um, it was always kind of a dream to create a, a farm um, that will allow uh, youth that left school for so many reasons uh, to find themselves into to find a good environment to 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 live in and to thrive in. And say more about what specifically you were doing as an educator and the frustration maybe you were feeling a little bit about the limitations of the education system that led you to found, to found Kaima. <clears throat> so I was working um, for more than, more than 10 years in a school. Actually, I was at the head of uh, the, um, I'm not sure how to say it in English, non-official education, probably you have a better word for that. Um, and I was also, uh, yeah, non-formal. Also, we were running a soup kitchen inside the kitchen with the kids themselves for 10 years. We were taking care of the needies and the elderies uh, in the Jerusalem area. And um, I was frustrated, not from this school, actually, this school was quite good, but I'm frustrated that we don't have enough environments for people who have many troubles in their life, you know, different things and everybody have to go to the same, uh, the same system. Um, so my decision was really because of that. I felt that we are um, not giving the right places for the people who left school for the people who went out of the jail, when I'm talking about ages, you know, the youth ages, people that haven't been uh, really successful um, in, in our society. Particularly those who have dropped out of school, right? Youth who have dropped out of school. Maybe share with us a little bit about specifically that what is Kaima, what is the Kaima model? What is the Kaima way? So Kaima is actually a farm and today uh, f five farms, I will tell you more later about them, but it's a farm um, that um, work with those youth and together we grow vegetables. Uh, the, veg the vegetables that we grow, uh, we sell to people, uh, people buy them, uh, invite them to their houses like a CSA, it is a CSA. Uh, we have 450 customers and we generate uh, between 60 to 70 percent depending on the year and the weather and the wild pig that just arrived to our farm. Uh, depending on them, uh, we even get to 70 percent income. Um, the youth are um, from variety of kind of them. As I said before, some been to the jail before, uh, some are addicted to drugs. Um, some are having problems inside their family with the family itself um, and um, mostly we have also 50% or more sometimes of our youth is, uh, is, um, is girls that have been sexually abused. Um, usually it comes with this story also, unfortunately, and they're all coming to work at 7.30. I do want to tell you a small story of how we started. Um, that we went to the welfare administration and we said we're going to work with those those youth um, and we're going to build a farm. We didn't have nothing, actually. We kind of got everything from good people who came and wanted to, to, to help us to create this farm. And the welfare administration told us they will never work with those youth because they are non-functional. They will not wake up in the morning and come to the farm. And it's been seven years already. Uh, people wake up at four or five o'clock uh, in the morning 
and get to the farm at 7.30 because sometimes they have to um, take three or four buses uh, from across the country and get to, to our little farm and they come and we have more than 250 alumni um, and very good result with 86% uh, return to school, even though it was never our goal. Our goal was to allow them to just feel good with themselves. But as uh, Yakir and Nati said very brightly, I think, and, it, and I think everybody knows that when we work uh, we outside in the soil, there's, there's something going on there. Something happened there. And when we, you add the, our little recipe that, that is mostly about um, relationship, how can you create relationship between adults and youth, real relationship, not therapeutic, not, uh, you know, educational relationship, but real relationship between human beings, you can also create this change. I think what's been most remarkable to me when I have visited Kaima is the interaction between your staff team and the youth, who I, sh I think should, I should mention they're, act they're paid employees, correct, of the farm, the youth, the youth are, so they're being paid for a day's work and they have high expectations of them, but it comes with with a return. The, the relationship is really something to witness because it's a very holistic approach. Right. Um, can you talk also about the, the franchising of Kaima, or maybe franchise isn't the right word, but now Kaima has been so successful that it's being replicated um, across the country, right? Yeah, I wish it was franchise, so I would be very rich. <laughs> but it's not the issue. One day. Uh, no, but it all started two years after we started. People started to came to come to the farm, and um, and they wanted to be involved or to create something that is that you know kind of kaima. And I thought about it a lot, and I didn't want us to be like a big NGO with tons of farms all over. And I just preferred to give our model to people. So it's like. Um, social franchise, we can call it. Um, and then I started to write it and to give and to allow people to be with us sometimes for a few months until they learn a model and also to get into our, um, you know, educational meeting that we have at the end of the day um, to read our materials. And we kind of create a way that you can take our model and duplicate it. And then we have today three more Kaima farms in Israel and actually one more abroad in uh, Africa, in uh, Tanzania, I think you say in English, Tanzania. Um, that's, that's number, with us, it's number five. Yeah. Incredible. Thank you, Yoni. Um, we're gonna be sending out some materials following this caller. We're gonna ask JFN to send out some materials. And so in addition to the report that Nati mentioned and some other materials, we'll include the, the web address for Yoni's for Kaima. Also, if you happen to be in Israel, in the Jerusalem area, it's quite a remarkable um, thing to visit. I know that you get a lot of different visitors, Yoni, people coming to study the model, but also just those who just really also want to participate in that transformative kind of experience that being on a farm can really, can really be, especially in Israel, in a very unique Valley. <laughs> Everyone is Which welcome. Is, thank you, Charmaine. Everyone is welcome. Thank, thank you. So before we go to some questions, um, Yakir mentioned the seed packet, and I think Nati, um, if you could talk for a few minutes, you're going into a, you've recently kind of um, transitioned the Jewish farm school, so maybe you'll talk a little bit briefly about that, but talk about the body of knowledge that you've assembled and um, and how that you've now bequeathed or provided to the field of Jewish community farming so that the intellectual capital and those materials and those rich resources and experience are now strengthening the capacity of the field. Great, yeah, thanks. So um, <clears throat> as, as Charlene mentioned, um, Jewish Farm School in May decided to um, close our doors, um, but we wanted to do so in a way that um, wouldn't just we were we wouldn't just kind of disappear, but kind of learning from both agricultural and ecological metaphors. When one thing dies in the forest, um, it uh, seeds new life. Um, 
And hold on one second, my son's here. But yeah, the couch. Mm -hmm. the couch. Wait, no, it's done. Bring him on. Um, you want to see him. Um, and um, I was so close to that not happening during this webinar. He's a farmer in training. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, <laughs> So, um, and one of the big goals of the, of the field building initiative was to figure out ways to support new and emerging projects, right? So many of the early Jewish community farming projects really like struggled to get going and put in a lot of hard work and how can we save other projects some of that effort? Um, and because these projects are so um, kind of local, uh, in their nature, um, I don't think there's the same kind of fear of competition that maybe other organizations or types of projects might have. Um, and so it, as part of our sunsetting process, we approached the, the, the leadership board of the field building initiative and said, you know, this is an area of the initiative that we haven't done too much around yet is supporting new and emerging projects. We have 14 years of experience that we would love to compile and share with the field. Um, can we kind of do this in partnership? Um, and uh, we were very grateful for, for the answer being yes um, from the field building initiative and some other funders as well. Um, and so we um, compiled a large collection of Jewish farm school curriculum, curriculum from Pearlstone, from some other projects. And in addition, we also um, compiled other types of resources. So I wanna just pull up on the screen um, if you go to the Jewish Farm School website, and I can put a link in the chat box as well, um, you'll see some information about this. So the Jewish Community Farming Seed Packet um, really has three main components. Um, practical tips for Jewish farms and gardens. So a wide range of very basic resources, budget templates, um, uh, planning documents, et cetera. Um, curriculum and pedagogical resources that I mentioned earlier, and a third section of organizational development resources, which is really kind of fundraising resources. So that's where you can find the report and the theory of change, the shared evaluation questions, um, fundraising, sample fundraising plans. The Leash Tag Foundation was really supportive in sharing some, some materials that they had developed. Um, and we released this to the public and it's all available free of charge. Um, so you can access it from the Jewish Farm School website. I'll put the link in the chat box momentarily. And that leads you to, if you go click on any of these links, um, you end up at, in a Google Drive um, and that um, has all of the information uh, and all of the documents and it's all uh, freely navigable for everyone. Um, and so far we've gotten really positive feedback about it. Um, we, uh, people have been, people who are doing this work, there's a new farm taking root at um, GAN Academy outside of Boston. And the person who is heading that project up, um, he reached out to just say that he's been pouring through the resources and they're incredible and they're gonna save him a ton of work. Um, so that's a newer project. We have um, educators and, and experienced practitioners in the field who've also been um, using some of the materials that they're finding in here. Um, so this was really an exciting and um, positive way for us to kind of wind down um, and do so in a way where we're, we're kind of planting seeds for, for the growth of the field as a whole. Thank, thank you, Nati. We are... Um... We're wrapping up, I think, our time. We're getting close to the end of the webinar. Um, we I, so I think we have time for one question, which I'm gonna ask um, all, any of our panelists to answer or all, which is that some of the funders involved are local, focus on their local community. So what are the, what advice, or what are, do you think are the first one or two steps if somebody either looked at that map that Yakir showed and said, oh, I really wanna see if I can support the start of a farm in my community. That sounds like a really good fit. Or if maybe somebody has land and it doesn't have to be a lot of land, but even a little bit of land that maybe thinks that they can provide that land for the startup of a farm in their community. What would be the, the steps that you think they should take or, 
or reach out to. Um, anybody that wants to take it can do so, <laughs> can jump in. I'll just say while our panelists are thinking about the question that what we did was we actually went on like a national tour where we uh, actually our president CEO Jim did this. He actually went out and visited Baltimore and visited Philadelphia and visited Connecticut and, and Berkeley and went to see the farms that are on that map, meet the people and in so doing was introduced to this rich field of talent that then helped guide us um, as we took our initial steps. Any advice, Yakir? Uh, yeah, I can. I'll, I'll jump in first, and, and Nati and Yoni, please, please jump in as well. I, I, uh, I think it's amazing that that there is this growing enthusiasm and interest in the work. Um, there are some entities, you know, in different places around the country. So I know all of us would be happy to make make um, introductions. And you know, I think there's absolutely. I've been dreaming for years about all the land that the Jewish community has access to that could become these projects I think that I think the thing I want to impress upon us is that the, the 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 move from raw land to you know outdoor Jewish classroom that really inspires uh, uh, youth family and, and can you know maximize potential as we've talked about today that the difference there is really around talent and and really around people who are devoting their lives and with so much passion and, and effort to it so I think the the question of land I've seen answered far more easily than the question of talent. And I think really trying to, to find the existing leaders in your community or through our network, right? This whole field building initiative, connecting you with either existing leaders or folks that are like really coming up and, and looking for these opportunities, building that relationship and really listening and hearing where those folks are at in their work, I think is, is a first step. Sometimes we really wanna jump into, where's the greenhouse gonna go? And, and how do we like jump right in? Where's the tractor? Let's get in there. And I think really starting with like, who, who are the people that are really ready to, to give themselves to this work? And really starting from a place of like, what are your goals? And what are our goals? And really starting to build the, the relationships because the most successful work I've seen in this work here and in other places is from a place of real you know, devotion and heart, heartfelt you know, kind of passion and commitment. And starting from that place, I think is, is really important. Thanks, Yakir. Nati, anything to add? Yeah, I'll add to that. I mean, I think that's, that's crucial. And I think one of the things that's important to think about in that context is how do we professionalize these positions and make these, um, these roles in the community actual career opportunities for people? So, you know, it's one thing when you're 23 years old and you don't mind sharing a room with four people and getting paid $100 a week to work on a farm. It's another thing if you're 40 years old and have a family that you're trying to support and, and you wanna be in a place for 10 or 15 or 20 years and what are kind of the salary requirements or something like that. And so I think really seeing these, um, like Yakir mentioned, this is not Jewish education light. This is substantive and impactful Jewish education. And how do we kind of professionalize those positions and, and treat them with the respect that they deserve? Um, the other thing that, that um, I would say is that um, so much can happen in relatively small spaces, right? The temptation is sometimes to start really big um, and managing a two acre farm is a lot more work than managing a quarter of an acre garden. Um, and, you know, managing a 10 or 15 or hundred acre project is significantly more and requires much more expertise and resources. Um, uh, Shoresh, which is uh, up in Toronto, for many years ran a relatively small garden in Toronto that served the local community. And once they had built up that track record and reputation, they were then gifted a hundred acre property outside of Toronto that they've now um, been developing into um, a larger uh, farm. Um, and so, you know, you can think incrementally and starting small and succeed pr your proof of concept and, and succeed with that and then build from there. I wanna mention one other organization that's been part of the field building initiative, which is Grow Torah. And their model has been a little different. Instead of having their own site, they partner with schools and I guess increasingly maybe camps, but also primarily in the Orthodox community to build Jewish educational gardens at these schools. And so they now have over a dozen sites that are impacting students in the schools where they're already going for learning. Um, they benefit from this kind of partnership um, and, and I think that model has huge potential for uh, uh, scalability and replication around the country. 
Um, and then the third thing I would say is um, we have this model um, really in, in Boulder with Milk and Honey Farm, which is part of the JCC of Boulder. Um, when they built the new JCC, integral to that design was a farm. And um, so having a project that's housed within a larger entity um, can save a ton of um, uh, effort and resources for the farm itself, where the farmers don't have to worry about insurance and payroll and, and operations and all that stuff. They can focus on the, the content themselves. Whereas a, a freestanding and independent Jewish community farm requires a lot more infrastructure to make it work. So look to where there are community assets that have land, have infrastructure, have the desire to, to, to make it happen, and then start to build your team around that. Really great advice. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to wrap up. Yakir mentioned talent before, and I just want to call out the tremendous talent on this call who are really representative of tremendous talent. I mean, they're the leaders and there is also tremendous talent in this field already, which we need to support, as Nati said. Um, and a room and room for and room for a lot of opportunity here. We feel very enthusiastic about the future. Um, when we work in this field. So um, I'm going to turn it back over to Tamar. JFN will be sending out some links and materials, and I believe that this recording will also be available online for all your friends and colleagues that you want to tell to watch it. Um, and thank you again to our wonderful panel. Tamar? Thank you. Yes, thank you. I just want to echo uh, that, that Akar Satov, and thank you so much for, for sharing your wisdom and all of this information. I know that I'm leaving inspired to see what piece, what piece I can do. My father's always been a gardener, and now I wanna share some of these things with him to maybe make it, add that dimension to it, and even the little things that I can do in, in Manhattan, which is, which is hard sometimes, but it's, thank you so much for sharing. And like Charlene said, I will be, I will share the links and um, I hope that we can just continue this conversation as we go forward in the, in the coming months. So thank you all and have a wonderful day.